recording. Go ahead. Okay. Our mission. Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background, and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at this meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Irene. That was wonderful. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce Marsha. Dr. Marsha Wiggins is a professional counselor, author, educator, consultant, public speaker, and retired clergywoman. She has published over 50 articles in professional journals and is the author of Integrating Religion and Spirituality into Counseling, a Comprehensive Approach. She is the recipient of a, re a writing award from the Association of Spiritual, Ethical, and Religious Values in Counseling. Dr. Wiggins is Professor Emerita of Counseling at the University of Colorado, Denver, and former Executive Director of the Association for Counselor Education and Supervision. She, learned, she earned a Master of Divinity degree from Emory University and a PhD from the University of Florida. Dr. Wiggins is also a mother who lost her 26-year-old son to a heroin overdose. She knows both professionally and personally what it is like to experience this unique form of grief. Read her story of loss and healing in From Heroin to Hope, Making Sense of the Loss of a Child. You can also learn more at www.drmarshawiggins.com. I'll put that in the chat box. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marsha Wiggins. Thank you uh, so much, Elizabeth and Irene. It is a real pleasure to be able to speak to the group tonight and to feel like um, there's a comradeship um, in loss and to be able to offer what I can um, on this healing journey that we're all um, a part of at this point. Um, so I'll start with a little of my personal background and my story, and then I'll move forward into talking a little bit about some of the unique aspects of losing a child to an overdose death. And then I'll move from there to talk about more common themes and some of the coping strategies that have worked for me and that I would offer to others on this um, journey of healing. So um, my story begins with the adoption of my son, Cameron. We adopted him from birth, picked him up at the hospital, um, and we had him for 26 years. And probably the worst day of my life was the day that I got a phone call from my son's uh, father, who was still living in Colorado. We had divorced several years previously, and I got a phone call from him at what was in the middle of the night in Florida, um, telling me that our son was in the ICU on life support as a result of a heroin overdose. And um, when I finally woke up enough to realize the shock of this phone call, um, I also noted that he was basically asking me um, for my permission to remove the life support, um, which of course was the hardest thing to do. Um, so when I realized what we were facing, I, I said, well, then I guess we have to learn, have to let him go. 
And I would say that that line, the task of letting him go in this life, um, has been the theme of the journey for me going forward. Um, I also want to add that as a person who um, has known, at least academically and intellectually, an awful lot about grief and loss as a professional counselor, um, I've worked with lots of people who have gone through various losses. Um, and so in some ways, it was pretty humiliating um, to have to deal with my son's addiction when I kept telling myself that I, of all people, should have been able to catch it earlier. I should have been able to intervene in it sooner. I should have been able to turn it around. Anybody with my background should have been able to um, stop this horrible monster that took my child. Ugh. But it's also very humbling to realize that um, heroin is a very powerful, powerful drug and no amount of um, energy, time, effort, money can necessarily turn that tide um, unless the person works very, very hard in their recovery, which unfortunately my son Cameron never got to that point in his own journey. So out of that story, um, I spent a lot of time working on my own uh, growth and response to this loss. Um, actually, um, his anniversary is on Sunday. It will be seven years. Um, so it's not like fresh, like the last three weeks or the last three months, like I've read on the website and on Facebook and I just ache for people who are at that place because it's so horrific. Um, and at the beginning, the shock is so devastating and the loss is so overwhelming that we think we're never going to get up again and we're never going to do our life again. Um, but I think that this group is real testimony to the fact that uh, we can do that and there are lots of ways that we can do that. And this kind of support is one of the things that I would highly recommend um, is staying with a kind of support. Um, so that's a little thumbnail sketch of my background. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the unique aspects of um, losing a child to an overdose either alcohol or drugs. Um, and in some ways, it's not unlike suicide um, in that there's kind of, it's a kind of self-harm, but in a different way, but some of the same things apply. So one of the biggest pieces of this experience is the stigma that's associated with drug use in our culture. And that stigma creates an awful lot of isolation it creates embarrassment and it keeps us from getting the kind of help that we need. Um, we're so embarrassed that our child should have this kind of problem that we don't talk about it. Um, and in the loss associated with a heroin or other drug overdose or alcohol overdose, the loss of that is sometimes considered uh, a moral flaw, a character defect, um, all of that goes back to the prohibition uh, back in the 1900s. And then there's a layer of criminalization um, that also sits on top of drug and alcohol use, especially by minors. Um, so here we are with a, with a child that we adore, whom the culture considers a criminal, um, morally, defective and all kinds of other things. And so the stigma is pretty difficult and it really gets in the way or it can get in the way of our healing. Um, one of the other things that happens when parents have been dealing with a child's addiction, and in my case, my son was an adult, which is a really different thing um, as opposed to a teenager or someone living, your child living in your home with you. Um, my son had gotten into drugs when he was a teenager. He was moved out at 18. And so there were several years that he was living on his own, 
and quite frankly, who knows where. Um, so that situation was a little bit difficult because he was an adult and I didn't have a lot of leeway in what I asked him to do or tried the help I tried to get for him. Um, but one of the other unique pieces of this is that we feel really guilty um, for not doing enough to prevent the death. And then on the other hand, we worry that we've been enabling the addiction. And so when we do help, we feel guilty for enabling. And if we don't help, we feel guilty for not doing enough. So that's a trap that parents often find themselves in when they have a child with an addiction. The other thing is, I think, very similar to uh, parents who lose a child to a terminal illness. Um, an addiction is a terminal illness. And in the case of my son with heroin, I sensed it was a terminal illness way before his death from it. Um, and so there is this process of grieving someone alive. And it's like losing the child before they're really gone. And so I experienced a lot of anticipatory grief of losing him in terms of who he was because the drug basically took his personality, hijacked his, his whole sense of self and his personality. And then this whole period of wondering every day if I would get that call that I eventually got. Um, so there is that kind of grieving um, that happens before the death and after the death. Um, I read in one person's um, blog, she said, to love an addict is to run out of tears. And that is pretty well characterizes that journey on, on the living side and the living hell of that kind of addiction. And then the other um, piece of it is that there is, at the end of this awful road of addiction, there is a kind of relief when it's all over. Um, and then there's the guilt for feeling relieved. Um, and so I think that's kind of a unique piece as well. As, long, as well as the, I guess the last piece I'm gonna talk about in terms of the uniqueness of losing a child to an addiction is the sense of blame that comes towards parents of these children. Um, there's a real need in our culture to blame people for bad things that happen to us or blame someone. And so I think that there's a lot of blame that comes at us as parents for not doing enough, what was wrong with our parenting? Were we too permissive? Were we too restrictive? Did our children not have enough protective factors? All of these things. And um, probably the most helpful thing that's, that I have read in dealing with this kind of blame and guilt that we feel about not being able to save our child um, is caught up in this little quote. And it goes like this. It says, I am an imperfect parent. Imperfect parenting does not cause addiction. If that were so, every child would grow up to be an addict. And I think that's a really, really graceful kind of quotation that, and, and I think you could fill in the blank for whatever cause it is um, that, that results in the loss of a child. Um, you can say, well, I'm an imperfect parent. Imperfect parenting um, does not cause accidents, terminal illnesses, suicide, murder. Um, imperfect parenting does not cause any of those things. And if it were so, then every child would have one of these problems that resulted in their death. Um, so that's been very gracious to me to realize that. Um, it wasn't my parenting that resulted in his death. And I can release that and not have to carry that. So moving forward, that's kind of in a nutshell, some of the really difficult things that people deal with when they've not only lost their child, but they're having to manage all of this kind of stigma. Um, so 
I'm moving ahead. Um, question is, well, how have I really coped with that? Um, what has happened as I've kind of put together both a professional academic knowledge and background in grief and loss and then a very horrific experience of it um, personally. Um, and the first thing I would say is that grief is definitely not linear. And even though we have theories that talk about kind of a set of stages, one, two, three, four, check these off, I did this, I did this, I did that, it's actually more of a cyclone. At least it feels like that to me, and I, I imagine others would agree, that it feels like I am caught up in some kind of whirlwind and I'm totally disoriented. And maybe I sat down for a few minutes and then I might be swept right back up into it again. So letting go of that sense that I should be at a certain place and be having a certain experience at a certain time or that there's any kind of timeline, calendar that tells me where I should be with this grief experience, um, just simply not so. Uh, so that, that's very important to know. Um, I would say that the other thing that has been really helpful to me is really practicing self-care. And a lot of people, I think especially women, are socialized to take care of others and not themselves. And so when you have this kind of loss, I have learned that if I don't take care of myself, I'm totally worthless for anybody else or offering anything to others. And so I've had to really focus on that in terms of my physical health, my practicing really good sleep habits. And I'm almost to seven years on the other side of this awful day. And I'm still having sleep difficulties. They're not as bad as they used to be. I still have them. Um, I've really had to pay attention to my nutrition, be intentional about that, be intentional about my exercise. I can remember the first week or so, um, I could hardly move forward, but I made myself walk around the block. And then I made myself walk a little, little farther, but my physical exercise, um, taking care of my spiritual life. Um, I was practicing yoga before that, and I started doing more of it because it made me feel like that the tension I was holding in my body could be released through that. And that was a real, that's been a really important um, self-care practice, as well as really digging deeper into my practice of um, meditation and mindfulness. And I'm sure that there have been other programs that are focused totally on this, but those have been very helpful to me. Um, also, um, being more compassionate about myself and not um, beating up on myself for not making more progress on the healing journey. Um, and not long after Cameron's death, I was mindlessly scrolling through Facebook, which kind of is a numbing experience, or it can be. And I came across this meme that was so helpful to me, and it just felt like a gift right out of who knows where, but it said this, it, it said, if only and I should have, will eat your brain. If only, and I should have, will eat your brain. And that has been such a gift to me because it helps me realize when I'm going down a rabbit hole of asking, why did this happen? What if I had caught it sooner? What if he had gone to a different rehab? What if they hadn't let him out of jail when they did and then he was on the street? I can, I can go a thousand different directions with that um, until I realize that it will eat my brain. And so I've tried to practice uh, interrupting those kinds of thoughts um, because I know they're not going anywhere helpful. Um, the other thing is developing compassion for other people um, and realizing that after going through this and living with this loss, um, I am so aware that everyone is carrying some kind of burden that we know nothing about. And so the practice of kindness, the practice of compassion, um, 
to perfect strangers realizing that people don't know what I'm carrying. I have no idea what they're carrying. So any kind of, uh, of kindness really helps. Um, and then the other thing I want to want to talk about is, um, and it's maybe a little bit academic, but it's been so helpful to me. And that is that there's a there is a a uh, theory of stress and coping that's been around for a long time, probably since the early '80s. Um, it was put together by two researchers called McCubbin and Patterson. And it's kind of a family coping, coping model that helps us understand how we're doing and what might be going on and in our crisis. And so briefly, um, these researchers say that um, the key to our adaptation to loss or the key to our accommodation of this kind of grief um, depends on three factors. One is before the loss, what were all the demands that were piling up on us um, before this happened? Okay, so some of that may look like, well, our work stress, um, maybe we lost a job, maybe we have elder parents, maybe we've been through a divorce, we're in an intense relationship with our partner, Maybe there's disabilities, financial problems, mental health issues, raising other children. That's the pileup of demand. So that's one factor that goes into our adaptation. Um, the second one is what are our resources and capabilities? And so our resources are not just money, but our attitudes, our knowledge, our support from our friends, from support groups like this, uh, from our family. What are our coping skills, our history of coping with trauma, other kinds of losses? That's the second piece. And then the third one is our perceptions, which means, you know, how do we see ourselves? Um, how do we tell ourselves that we're able to cope with something like this? Um, what is our belief system? Uh, what do we think happens to people after they die? How does that story um, in, in, um, impact us and what is our commitment to our family going forward so i've run through that pretty rapidly but the the pileup of demands the resources and capabilities and the perceptions coming together predict how someone will do with um, a crisis and they also predict it on the other side of the crisis um, so if you're really struggling with this kind of loss um think about the de other demands in your life if you're if you're not just getting up and going forward maybe it's because you have a really big pile up of demands uh, more than another person and fortunately when this awful thing happened to me my pile up was lower than it had been at other times in my life and i'm grateful for that and i realized that pile up of demands is huge when it's taking energy away from the healing process. Um, resources too. I happen to have um, a fair number of resources in all of these kind of categories that really helped me uh, manage. Um, and I have a, a faith, a belief system, um, and I have this really kind of strong belief that we can't control anything in our life except our attitude towards what happens to us. Um, and that belief system has really helped me um, as, a, as a perception. Um, so this model helps me think about um, how am I doing? Well, if I'm not doing as well as the person next to me, maybe I have too big of a pile of demands or I don't have enough resources. Um, or maybe I'm telling myself a story about what happened to my child or about my parenting um, or a host of other things I'm telling myself that are not very helpful to my healing journey. Um, maybe even I'm telling myself, I'll never get over this or I will never be able to function in any kind of new normal. Um, so those are ways to help think about how one could work on reducing the demands, increasing the resources, and changing the perceptions um, 
that helps us accommodate to a crisis like this. Um, so what are some other things that I've been able to do? Um, and I'm going to run through these really quickly. They're very specific, but some of them are pretty fun and they made a lot of difference to me. The first thing I did was five years ago, um, I broke my ankle. And so I was on my bed with my foot over my head for four months. And I thought, well, I can just sit here and be miserable and think about Cameron and this loss, or I can try to do something positive. So what I did, and I don't know if, if folks can see this, but what I did was I made a, um, can you see this, Elizabeth? I made a memory um, book of his life. I got all the photos from the 26 years, had them digitized and made a, a memory book. And yeah, it was painful looking at all the pictures um, and, you know, putting the captions and remembering all those times. Um, but what I think really helped me was realizing that Cameron's addiction was not his whole life. It was one little piece of it. In fact, this is, I don't know how many pages, there may be three pages that are during the time of the addiction. The rest of it was wonderful. So getting that in perspective was really good for me. The other thing is that um, because Cameron was an addict, he had nothing, he sold everything. He sold his computer before I had it paid for. Um, so there was nothing that he had really left for me to keep except for, get this, his boxer shorts were in a, in a box at his dad's house. So I got those and I, a really sweet friend of mine made them into a travel pillow. I don't know if you can see this, but um, this is kind of my thing that I take with me on trips. Um, and it has all of these different boxer shorts, mostly the ones I bought him for holidays and, and other things. The other thing I've done that I've really um, enjoyed, and I'm going to do it again on Sunday, I had these, um, I had printed out these little cards, and I don't know if you can see these, but these are from the Kindness Project that one of the really big grief scholars has, well, has talked about. And I made this card, I'll tell you what it says. It says, this random act of kindness is done in memory of Cameron Frame. November 20th, 1986, August 9th, 2013. And so I just went around and did stuff for people and left them these cards. And I sent them off to friends and asked them to do the same. And it was just such a joy to hear from friends all over the country of what they had done in Cameron's memory um, during the week of his um, anniversary. So. Um, that's my plan for Sunday afternoon. Having a plan helps me with his birthday, with holidays, with this upcoming anniversary. So um, that I think has been really helpful. Um, the one thing that I'd like to kind of share with closing comments here um, is a poem that a friend of mine who's quite a wonderful writer and artist, her name is, um, is Jan Richardson. And she's written a book called The Cure for Sorrow. And I'm gonna share this poem with you. She sent it to me um, for use at my son's memorial service. And I have it framed and I keep it in, in my room. And uh, here's what it says. It, it's called Stay a Blessing. And she says, I know how your mind rushes ahead trying to fathom what could follow this. What will you do? Where will you go? How will you live? You will want to outrun the grief. You will want to keep turning toward the horizon, watching for what was lost to come back, to return to you and never leave again. For now, hear me when I say, all you need to do is to still yourself, to turn toward one another, is to stay, wait, Wait and see what comes to fill the gaping hole in your chest. Wait with your hands open to receive what could never come, except to what is empty and hollow. You cannot know it now, cannot even imagine what lies ahead. But I tell you, the day is coming 
when breath will fill your lungs as it never has before. And with your own ears, you will hear words coming to you new and startling. You will dream dreams and you will see the world ablaze with blessing. Wait for it. Still yourself. Stay. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to let you know that there are so many people writing about all of these different ideas that you've given uh, in the sidebar, in the chat box. Andrea is saying, this is beautiful. Thank you for sharing this great information. Helpful. Barbara is saying, a beautiful book of terrific memories. Perfect. Uh, Cheryl is saying, I made a memory book for my daughter, a few photos, but lots of poems, quotes about, the, about death and the afterlife. Heidi says that she likes the concept of a book to uh, memorialize. Uh, Anna says, I love the pillow. What a great idea. And Valentina says, I had pillows and teddy bears made from my son's dress oh. shirts. Um, Debbie is saying, I love that. I couldn't part with my son's clothing, so I made a quilt from his pants. Terry is saying, I love that idea. Sandra is saying, beautiful way to honor Cameron. Um, and then Heidi is also saying that she loves the concept of a book of memories and how it shows the wonderful life of our child, which was unfortunately punctuated by a period of addiction um, not sure in ready, uh, that I'm ready yet to look through all of the pictures. Um, Alicia is saying this information and ideas for memorializing my daughter is wonderful. Thanks. Um, and then Tina is saying, I have a t-shirt blanket. Thankfully, my son still lived at home, so I have all of his stuff. Oh. Um, so there, there are just so many people who are saying that this is this is something that I think that either they've done or maybe they are considering doing as well. Tammy loved your poem as well. And um, I was just going to ask if maybe, uh, because Sandra is the person that suggested that you come to speak, if you would be willing, Sandra, to talk a little bit about Marsha and about your son as well. Would you be willing to do that? Yes, let me unmute you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wonderful. So Sandra is also in Florida and she uh, has a nonprofit. Um, and maybe you could just say a little bit about your nonprofit and about your uh, meeting Marsha and about what she's done for you. Well, uh, I'm first of all, thank you so much for having Marsha tonight. Cause I got so much the first time I heard Marsha speak that. I just want to share Marsha with everybody. <laughs> so I'm just so happy. And thank you, Marsha, for coming tonight, because I know this group really uh, needs to hear your words. Um, uh, the first time uh, my husband and I went to listen to Marsha speak, I, I like to say that she kind of paved the beginning of the pavement of my um, healthy, uh, intentional, deliberate journey of grief. Um, uh, and then when I went and bought her book, uh, From Heroin to Hope, the book looks like one of those Christmas trees that you fold all the corners in on the magazine and click it together and it stands up by itself because everything made so much sense. I wanted to highlight everything so that I could read everything. Um, it just, it, at the end of each chapter, it asks you questions. And it, it lets you just process what she, the information that she's just given you. And it's not just one way of thinking. It's, it's a lot of, um, a lot of information with, with, with different ways to consider something in your mind. Um, my favorite was about imperfect parents um, because I've learned so much over the past two years and four months or whatever it's been. And um and one of the most important things that I've learned is, you know, guilt and regret are two things we can't do anything about. And the more that I've learned, the more knowledge um, that I've gotten, um, I've learned I didn't cause my son's addiction. And I love my son. I didn't love him any less um, than I loved my other children who do not suffer from addiction. And I learned also that my grief started way before he passed away. 
as I lost him slowly, the person that I knew and loved. And I couldn't have cured him. I could only be there to support him, but it had to come from within him. And I, I think after something like this happens, you know, we, we want to know why. We want to make reason of it. We want to point a finger or, or even if the finger is pointed at ourselves to say, I'm supposed to take care of my child. I'm supposed to fix it. You know, from the time we find out we're expecting, we're programmed to fix our children's pain or problems because we're good, loving parents. And this is something you can't fix. And when you get to the realization that this is stronger than something love can fix, it's very, very hard. It's a very, very painful realization. And uh, listening to Marsha, I've, I've listened to her many times. Um, Marsha, uh, I had Marsha as a guest at our local grasp meeting on my birthday um, uh, over a year ago. And uh, everyone said, that's what you want to do on your birthday? And I said, yes, that is exactly what I want to do on my birthday. And uh, we've become very dear friends. And I'm very grateful because... I just feel like I'm constantly, every time I stalk Marsha and listen to one of her YouTubes, <laughs> I just feel like I hear something different every time. And every time I pick up the book, I get something else out of it each time. So um, I hope that everybody here, um, you know, has, has gotten something from Marsha this evening. Um, Joshua, I, I didn't even say, Joshua was 30 years old and we lost him to an accidental overdose uh, four days after he got out of rehab. And um, it, it was very, very hard and it's been a very hard journey. Um, but I, I do feel that, you know, this journey is not something that we need to do alone, that, you know, we're united, we're stronger than addiction. and. Uh, I, I have met so many incredible, wonderful people over the past two and a half years. Um, and I'm really grateful for that and the support. And um, I guess, you know, I'm sure people have a lot of questions to ask Marsha. They don't need to listen to me. Well, I, um, I am just so grateful that you introduced me to Marsha. I, I truly appreciate it. And I, I'd like to just... Um, read something written by Carol Hennessy, who is actually one of our caring listeners. And I think that this is beautiful. People have asked me how I'm so strong after such a recent loss. Brendan ran ahead to heaven in June of 2018. I've told people uh, here on earth that it was that life here on earth was hell. It is for any addict. He is now free from pain and addiction. He is finally at peace. Now I focus on helping others in honor of my son. Sadly though, his addiction, uh, sadly through his addiction, I lost him before he ever left this earth, which I think that that's kind of a pain. And I, I think it's um, beautiful too that you're also, um, but I was going to say Carol is a caring listener. And I think it's wonderful that she is now doing this to help other parents, but you also have a, a nonprofit uh, Sandra, did you want to just say something about Oh, that? I just say it really quickly. And that was a hard thing for me because I don't fix out anybody else, but I, I run personal ponies for the state of Florida, the little tiny therapy ponies that can go right into hospitals and nursing facilities. And I work with medically fragile and special needs children and Alzheimer's and dementia patients. So here my days were spent helping people and you can imagine the realization when it finally came to me that I couldn't help my own child. Um, you know, and when Marsha talks about that, you know, I really feel that kinship because I remember that moment thinking I can't help my own child. And I do use the therapy ponies now. Um, we do go into detoxes and rehabs. And I also speak every month at a rehab, some of the Mothers in the room right now have been to the rehab with me um, and spoken and, and, and it's very helpful, um, just like it's helpful for us to hear from one another. I have gotten to know Josh better by speaking every month at a rehab and having that open conversation, you know, hearing from them what they have to say. And they have learned so much listening to me, they never even considered their mother's perspective of how this was affecting their mother. Because 
you know, some of the times, you know, our reaction was we were just really angry and pissy and we had every right to be. Um, but, but it's really, it's really uh, very unique because there's such openness and candid, candid um, conversations. So anybody who thinks they want to do that, I would um, encourage them to reach out to local um, facilities in your area and see if you can speak. It's so, it'll be so, it'll be hard, but it's like going to the gym, you know, it's hard, but you become stronger. And um, it's, it's been so helpful to me in my journey. That's a wonderful thing to do. And I didn't realize that you'd started the ponies before he passed, but that's, that's a beautiful thing to do to go around as well and speak at all of these uh, rehabs. And I, I just want to say that Deb is saying, Marsha, I am going to seminary school to become a chaplain. I start next month. Yesterday was my daughter's one year anniversary, beautiful Phoebe. Um, uh, she passed of a fentanyl overdose. Thank you so much. Um, and then Carol is also saying that she just started speaking at rehab, which is wonderful as well. Um, Lindsay is saying, my son passed from suicide had been on meth but clean for six weeks he couldn't fight the depression anymore i couldn't save him from himself um i think that everybody uh, has to a degree that same feeling but i think that no matter how our kids pass we all have guilt it's it's an impossible thing not to have and being able to work through that guilt and get rid of it because it, it's not because of us I truly believe that it's already decided before they ever come here um, that this is going to happen. Nobody has to believe that way, but I, I think that um, it is something that we have very little control over. And having something like this happen in our lives, it's what we do with our lives with this tragedy that makes our lives important. And so you both, Marcia and Sandra, are doing so much to help others. It's just wonderful. Um, I'm looking for questions. I'm just getting a whole bunch of people saying how wonderful it is to hear what you had to say, Marcia, as well as Sandra. Um, so let's see. Um, Elizabeth, I think Terry asked earlier when she got negative feelings in her head, how to how to switch them. Maybe Terry, you could repeat your question, but I read it earlier and I think it was a really good question. Okay, good. I'm looking back, scrolling to see, but if I can find um, Terry in the chat box, I must have scrolled past that. But let's see, Terry, maybe you could raise your hand if you'd like to unmute yourself. We could just, um, let's see. If not, let me just try. Um, that's a great question though. Why don't we just go ahead and have Marsha answer that? Would you like to go ahead and take that question, Marsha? Sure. Um, I think the, the thing about getting in a thought spiral, a negative thought spiral, is one of those things that can drag us down pretty quickly. Um, and I would say that developing one's sense of awareness in the present moment is really critical so that we're aware of what we're actually thinking. And sometimes I know I've been aware of not being, not knowing that I'm driving and probably some of you have too, like you end up somewhere and you say, well, how did I get here? I don't even remember. Um, and so really getting our, our thoughts focused more in the present helps us realize when we're having these thoughts. That's the first thing is becoming aware that we're starting down that negative spiral um and then trying to to i guess what what we say is um as counselors we say um that we externalize those thoughts and that means like making them objective or making them something outside of ourselves so sometimes i even talk to the thoughts and say you know negative thought or guilt thought or blaming thought um, you are not going to have power over me today um, so that I can interrupt it in a way that keeps me from getting so far down that it's hard to climb back out. That's a beautiful answer. 
I think that it's wonderful to talk to them specifically and be able to deal with them that way and tell them to go away. And I do see the question from Terry now. Um, also, Anna is saying, how long did it take uh, to overcome the tra tragic loss of your son? Do you have a, a good idea of your timeline in terms of what that was like for you, Marsha? Well, I would say that I don't know that I've yet overcome it. I would say that I've made a space for it. Um, and I think that, like I, I was trying to say about the meditation, um, I did a lot of meditation on the, on issues of resistance versus acceptance. And um, so making a space, not that I'm going to get past it, but um, it's, it's something I'm carrying with me. And so like with my ankle, when I broke my ankle, um, I guess it took me probably six months to be able to walk on it again in some normal fashion. Um, I would say it was at least a year before I felt somewhat normal after Cameron's death. Um, but like the ankle, um, there are all kinds of times that I'm not expecting it, that it, it hurts. Like I tried to go snowshoeing in Colorado and my ankle had been fine. And this was after like three or four years. I thought, oh, I'm good. I'm working out with a trainer. I'm doing all this, did physical therapy. And all of a sudden the ankle was like, yikes, I can't do this. Um, and similar thing happens like one time I walked into the grocery store and a woman was coming out with a birthday cake for a little kid and I just lost it. And that had been like four years in. Um, so I think it's just that um, living with a day to day, like you live with any kind of injury or, or whatever, it's, um, I think my ankle's probably stronger because it has a lot of titanium in it. Um, and I think I'm stronger because, as Sandra said, I make myself talk about this and talk to people about it. Um, we so. are stronger. You're exactly right. And we are in a position to be able to help others with our strength. And it's such a wonderful thing that you are doing that. Leon is asking, how do I deal with the anger I feel about the pandemic, which has led to so many losses? I hear from people all over with loss doing, uh, due to pandemic cir circumstances. So this is not exactly the same thing, but do you have any uh, thoughts or suggestions about that, Marsha? Um, I do have thoughts about that. I don't know if I have suggestions, but um, my thoughts about it are that, um, like now the whole world is living in some kind of loss. Um, it's not the loss of a child, but it's a loss of our normal life. And so um, as much as we try to entertain ourselves and eat and cook and do all kinds of comforting things, we're still experiencing the loss of our life um, as we've known it. And so there's a grief that's going on that we may not be naming as grief. Um, so that might be one thing. The second thing is that um, this pandemic is part of the pileup of demands that I was talking about earlier. So not only do we have the regular things that are challenging in our lives, now we've got this blanket of something that's holding us down and is very scary and is costing us lives and livelihoods. Um, that's one more level of a demand that makes moving through a grief process even more difficult. Um, because things are not normal as we would want them to be. So we've got, we're dealing with that. Um, so I would also say that any kind of loss triggers the next loss. So this pandemic is a trigger for all of our losses. Um, I guess that's how I would respond. Yeah, I think you're very right. I think that it's a lot harder. Um, in some ways for us, but it's also a lot easier because we've experienced the worst thing that we could ever experience in the whole world. Right. And we've come through it and nothing ever, ever could be as bad as having a child pass. So 
I feel almost fortunate that we've all been through this and we know that we can survive. And, um, and I, I hate that our world is going through this, but I do think that this gives us a perspective that is a lot, um, a lot more hopeful and a lot more healing than may, many people are probably feeling right now. So um, anyway, also there's another question that I think is a good one. Um, Peggy's asking, what are your thoughts on taking prescription medications to help one cope? Um, well, I guess that's, I don't have a general perspective on that. I think that that has to do with one's personal history, one's physical health, one's doctor's assessment. Um, it's not the kind of thing I could put out there and say, yes, this is good. No, this isn't good. Um, personally, um, I, I did get sleeping medications when I, this first happened. Um, and I took them and I didn't really like the way they made me feel. And then I started reading all this research on sleep and I decided that that was the last thing that was going to be good for me. So I've done all kinds of other sorts of interventions. Um, and I'm not a person that takes any other kind of medication. So it was really outside of my experience. So for me, it's not been the thing that helps and medications for short term depression or whatever are sometimes appropriate, but it just depends on your doctor, your therapist. Um, uh, one of the interesting things is that some of the research on depression suggests that therapy and exercise are as effective as um, antidepressants. Well, Carol is saying my meds are yoga and meditation. I yeah. guess I would say that too. I've been doing so much yoga and meditation, actually yoga mostly and hiking since Morgan yeah. passed. And I feel that they are just so healing. But um, I, I have another question that I think is really interesting from Paula. And she's saying, how do you handle the feelings of regret for all the losses that your son had? Um, could you maybe address that? Um. Well, I guess I try to put that in the balance. I mean, looking, when I allow myself to look forward, I think, well, um, he didn't get to have a partner. He didn't get to have children. I didn't get any grandchildren, which all my peers have, and I am never going to have. He was my only child. Um, and they're just all the things of the life cycle that he isn't going to have. Um, but then I think about in his 26 years, he had an awful lot of wonderful experiences that some of, of which he was able to have because he was an only child. And he, we took him on lots of international trips. He went to summer camp. He was in the Boy Scouts. His dad took him hiking and fishing and backpacking. So, I mean, he had a pretty full, wonderful life until he got involved in the addiction. So um, every life is peppered with good and bad. And um, I guess I think of it as I'm much more grateful that we did what we were able to do with him when we had him uh, and that we didn't wait till we had enough money or till we had something else. Um, yeah. Well, that's beautiful too. And I think that one of the things that I realize over and over again, whenever I learn about these incredible kids, because they're all incredible and all such old souls, is that they are all friends now. They're all bringing us together. They're connecting us here and they are so excited about it. So every time that we have a meeting like this, I think, oh my gosh, they're just celebrating to know that we're, that we're together. And again, I always say they high five each other when they see us smile. Wow. And I just, think that it's so incredible what they are doing over there to help with this pandemic, to help with us to heal, to help with everything that they're doing. So I never have any regrets about Morgan or about Chelsea 
because they are doing so much there. And sometimes I feel a little envious because I think, oh my gosh, they are meeting some of the most incredible people. I hear about kids meeting John Lennon. What, who was it? Rose the other night <laughs> was able to hear about her son hanging out with John Lennon. And I know my son has told me through psychics that he's hanging out with John Lennon. There's some pretty amazing people over there. So anyway, I don't think anybody should have regrets because um, al although it's understandable to do so because as you move forward and as you form that really close relationship with them, you're going to feel more and more connected with them and you're not going to miss out on anything with them and they're not missing out on anything with you. So anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to break in there and <laughs> wax on about that. Let's see, I wanna make sure we have answered all of the questions now though. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Terry's saying, I still read the parts I highlighted in your book. I found it very helpful then and now. Thank you for coming to help all of us. And um, other people are saying that our kids are together. Of course they are. Um, let's see. Um, so let's see. Uh, that's what I hold on to now that it was like, what it was like before the addiction. So Sherry is saying that she holds on to the memories that she had um, of when everything was easier, I'm sure. I'm trying to see here. People are saying, thank you, Marcia and Sandra. Thank you, Sandra, for introducing Marcia to us. This is wonderful. And um, so your book is available on Amazon, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And you have a website as well that I put up in the beginning, but I'm not sure if people remember. It's just www.drmarshawiggins.com. Could you possibly type that, Irene, while I'm um, before we go, just so that people are able to find you? And um, are there any other uh, thoughts that you have before we uh, have everybody say goodbye? Um, I just want to thank you for all the work that you and Irene and others have done for this group. And I think one of the best ways of um, moving forward is having people that share the journey because it makes the burden lighter. And I just have to say one of the benefits um, for me has been, you know, meeting these women that have had the same experience and, um, there are people who really understand and that's such a gift. So thank you for doing this. Well, thank you for coming to speak to us and we'll have this on YouTube. So it'll be available probably this evening. And before we go, we always ask everyone to unmute and say goodbye and thank you. And thanks all of you to be, for being here this evening. I truly appreciate it. Yeah. And um, so, so much. We'll yeah. definitely thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank, you. you. Thank, thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you tomorrow for caring. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>